Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, I'm honored to welcome my friend, Prime Minister Turnbull of Australia, and Mrs. Turnbull. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. We're looking forward to sending our newly nominated ambassador, Admiral Harry Harris, to you very shortly. He's an outstanding man. You're going to find that. He's a great man. I want to thank the Prime Minister for offering his condolences on the horrible tragedy in Parkland, Florida. Americans are grateful for the prayers and support of our Australian friends, and friends they are, as our entire nation grieves the senseless loss of 17 precious lives and all of the horribly injured. The United States and Australia are currently honoring 100 years of mateship, a term that you use very beautifully, Mr. Prime Minister. A century has passed since brave Americans and Australians first fought together in World War I. Over the last 100 years, our partnership has thrived as a bulwark of freedom, security, and democracy. Last spring, the Prime Minister and I celebrated the remarkable 100-year milestone during an extraordinary evening on the USS Intrepid. And my friend Greg Norman and Anthony Pratt and some of the others who are in the room today, they were — hello, folks. Stand up, Greg. Stand up, Anthony. Where's Anthony? Good. It was a great — it was a great evening. Thank you. This afternoon, I'm pleased to announce that the United States will name the littoral combat ship 30, the USS Canberra, in honor of an Australian cruiser lost fighting alongside the U.S. Navy during World War II. Our Secretary of the Navy has chosen Australian Minister of Defense Maurice Payne to be her sponsor. I know that the USS Canberra will be a worthy successor to both her Australian namesake and her American predecessor, the former Navy Baltimore-class heavy cruiser, USS Canberra. As she sails the open sea, the new USS Canberra will symbolize to all who cross her path the enduring friendship between the United States and Australia. There is no closer friendship. Today, strengthened by our common values and history, we're working together to promote our mutual interests. I want to thank the Prime Minister for serving as a strong voice for peace and stability across the entire Indo-Pacific region. Australia is one of our closest partners in our campaign of maximum pressure to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Today, we put the strongest sanctions on Korea that we have ever put on a country. We must continue to stand together to prevent the brutal dictatorship from threatening the world with nuclear devastation. Our nations likewise share a commitment to keeping our people safe from terrorism. Australian troops are currently serving alongside Americans and our partners in Afghanistan and the coalition to defeat ISIS. Together, we're denying terrorists safe haven, cutting off their funding, and discrediting their wicked ideology. ISIS land has been largely recaptured, almost 100 percent. I'm very honored to say. And they are on the run. Our strong partnership can also be seen in our flourishing economic relationship. Australia remains a key market for U.S. defense products. We make the greatest products in the world, so you have very good taste in choosing our product. <laughs> Automobiles and aircraft and our fair and reciprocal trading relationship is a model for other countries as we seek bilateral agreements. News that America is open for business has also reached Australian shores. In May, Australian entrepreneur Anthony Pratt announced a new $2 billion investment in box-making factories across the United States. But he only did that if Trump won the election, I think. Is that a correct statement, Anthony? Thank you. Boy, that was a close one. I was worried. <laughs> These people would have had a field day if you gave the wrong answer. Thank you. No, but Anthony did call, and he said, if he wins the election, we're going to spend billions of dollars in the United States. And I appreciate your 
giving me a very, very correct comment. Thank you, Anthony. I'll never do that again. <laughs> this investment will continue to build on an almost 100,000 American jobs that are taking place and already supported by Australian companies. I'm glad to share that the United States is also by far the largest investor in Australia. In the room today are dozens of American and Australian business leaders and great athletes — great athlete and business leader, by the way, Greg — who are working together to identify further opportunities for bilateral investment and cooperation. Mr. Prime Minister, I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your immigration reforms and on Australia's commitment to merit-based immigration. Are my friends from Congress listening to that? Merit-based. We want to do merit-based immigration also. And then we will. That really protects the interests of Australia and its people. It's the way to go. And you've been very successful with it here. We're working very hard to do the same. In that sense, we're going to hopefully follow in your footprints. Prime Minister Turnbull, it's been a pleasure to host you today. We had a great lunch with your representatives. A lot was discussed. A lot of deals were made for the purchase of additional military equipment and other things. For a century now, the people of the United States and Australia have inspired the world with their determination, their bravery, and their generosity. I know that our close friendship and enduring alliance and our personal friendship will grow even stronger in the century to come. Our relationship with Australia will always be a very powerful and very successful relationship. It's been incredible, and it's only getting better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. Mr. President, thank you so much. Lucy and I want to thank you and First Lady Melania Trump for your very warm welcome, your generous hospitality and friendship. Uh, our meeting today was a great opportunity to strengthen and deepen our engagement with the United States. You are our most important strategic and economic partner and to lay the groundwork for a new phase of intensified cooperation the next hundred years of mateship. Now, I'm here, as you noted, Mr. President, with the most substantial Australian delegation ever to travel to Washington, D.C. We have, in addition to the CEOs, several of whom you have uh, identified here today, who are busy creating jobs, and we spent much of our time this today talking about jobs, they are creating jobs in Australia and in the United States, demonstrating that our two great nations committed to competition, to freedom, to economic innovation, science and technology working together complement each other, and that's why we're seeing strong jobs growth in both countries. We've had 403,000 jobs created last year in Australia, the largest number, Mr. President, in our country's history in 16 months of continued jobs growth. And we have been inspired, uh, I have to say, by your success in uh, securing the passage of the tax reforms through the Congress. Uh, we, we have uh, secured uh, some tax uh, reforms in terms of reducing company tax, but not as much as we need to do. We've got more work to do. And the stimulus, the economic stimulus that your reforms have delivered here in the United States is one of the most powerful arguments that we are deploying to persuade our legislature to support reducing business tax because as you are demonstrating and as we all know, when you cut company tax, most of the benefit goes to workers, it produces more investment and when you get more investment you get more jobs. And, of course, I'm also joined uh, on this visit with uh, six of the leaders of our states and territories. The only two that are not here, Mr. President, are those that are fighting elections. So, uh, as you can imagine, that's always a top priority. Uh, and we're meeting at the National Governors Association, again, broadening and deepening uh, the relationship. 
Uh, we have a huge amount to work with. Our relationship, as you said, has been forged over a century through times of war and peace, securing both our nation's freedom and security in the world. But our relationship is based not only on history. We have the same values. We share a deep well of trust and spirit based on those enduring values of freedom, democracy, the rule of law, enterprise, ingenuity, the spirit of having a go, and if it doesn't work out, dust yourself off and have another go. That is a core American and Australian value. That spirit of enterprise is what leads us on. And of course, our relationship is underpinned by millions of people to people and family links and of course the extensive economic cooperation we've spoken about. Our security alliance is as close as it possibly could be, yet keeps getting closer. The cooperation is more intense than it has ever been. Whether we are standing up for freedom's cause in the Middle East, in our region, uh, around the world, combating terrorism, the cooperation in a connected world that we need to have is greater than ever. And that trust between Australia and the United States, between the thousands of brave servicemen and women who are working together right now, that trust underpins our security. And you mentioned, Mr. President, our economic relationship and trade. Do you know since the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement came into force, in 2005, two-way trade has grown by over 50%. The, the United States does have a trade surplus with Australia uh, of uh, $25 billion. Uh, it's your third largest trade surplus with us. Uh, but, you know, we know it works for both of us. The two-way investment has more than doubled in the past decade. It was worth around $1.1 trillion in 2016. Again, boosting jobs and growth in both our nations, both our economies. And today, we've agreed on some new initiatives that will deepen this relationship further. We're seeking to expand transparent and competitive global energy markets, cooperating on high quality infrastructure investment in the United States and in the region. We've spent a lot of time talking about infrastructure, including urban infrastructure, a, a subject, Mr. President, of course, uh, you have a lifetime of experience in, and the leadership you're showing on infrastructure in the United States is, is being admired around the world, and Australian companies uh, and Australian experience is there to help, as, uh, as, as, as you know, and is already operating here. A number of our infrastructure players are very active in the US. Uh, we're obviously working to intensify our cooperation on digital trade, Bob Lighthizer and Wilbur Ross from your side, Steve Chobo, my trade minister who's here with them today, have made terrific progress in that regard. Now, we turn to security. Yesterday, Lucy and I were with General Dunford at uh, the Arlington National Cemetery. And we honoured America's war dead. We honoured an Australian airman who had uh, died in combat in in New Guinea in the Second World War, who was buried there at Arlington also. And we are reminded that all of the freedoms we enjoy, whether it is in our parliament in Canberra or here in Washington in the White House or in the Congress, all of those freedoms have had to be secured generation after generation by courageous men and women defending freedom's cause. Our freedoms have depended on them. And Americans know, as Australians know, that each of us have no better ally. We are mates, a hundred years of mateship. We're working together, as you said, to address the greatest threat to our region right now, North Korea's illegal nuclear weapons program. And I want to welcome and, of course, support, Mr. President, the new sanctions that have been announced today. And we continue to do precisely the same with our own autonomous sanctions and, of course, enforcing the UN Security Council mandated sanctions. We're working to combat terrorism around the world, helping the Iraqis and the Afghans build up the resilience to hold their countries uh, secure in the face of terrorists. 
And of course, we both recognise that the prosperity of our region, and indeed the world, has been underpinned and in fact built on a foundation of a rules-based order which has been secured by the leadership of the United States ever since the Second World War. That leadership has been critical. And the commitment you showed, Mr. President, when you came out to the region, to the East Asia Summit, to APEC last year, that commitment was so important. It spoke volumes for America's continued commitment to our region, to our part of the world, to the Indo-Pacific. So vital. The, the engine room, if you like, of the fastest economic growth, the most rapid economic growth that we've seen in our times. Now, Mr. President, I want to thank you, as I have um, earlier in our meetings, I want to thank you for the very rare honour you have shown to Australia by naming one of your future littoral combat ships, the USS Canberra. That is what a, what a great symbol of our alliance and our shared security endeavours. What, what an extraordinary statement of commitment. And a, it's worth observing that that ship will be built by Austal in Mobile, Alabama. So you have an Australian company with American workers working, operating in the United States, building ships for the, for the US Navy. What a great example of 100 years of mateship. And when you grieve, as you said, you noted at the outset, so do we. So we send our love, our prayers and our condolences to all of the victims and their families of the shocking shooting in the school in Florida. We are mates, we stand by each other, and when we are hurt, we are hurt as well. So, Mr. President, thank you for your warm welcome. A hundred years of mateship, we celebrate a hundred years ago on July 4. John Monash, General John Monash, led American and Australian troops into battle in the First World War for the first time. And we've been side by side ever since. A hundred years of mateship celebrated and a hundred more years to look forward to closer than ever. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. That's very uh, beautiful words, and we appreciate it. On behalf of the First Lady, who is right here, and our great Vice President, Mike, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you. And we'll, ask, uh, we'll answer a couple of questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, how about uh, Trey from One American News? Trey, where are you? Hi. Good, Trey. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. I have a couple questions for you. Um, if you, uh, how about answer. one? <laughs> Go ahead. Compromise it too. Uh, following mass shootings, there's often a lot of talk and little action. So I ask you today: What specific pieces of legislation or legislative framework will you propose to lawmakers following the Parkland shooting? Well, we're going to do a lot, but we are going to be very strong on background checks. Uh, I've spoken with many of our people in Congress, our senators, our congressmen and women, and there's a movement on to get something done. We want to be very powerful on background checks. Uh, when uh, we're dealing with the mentally ill, as we were in this last case, he was a very sick person and somebody that should have been nabbed. I guess they had 39 different occasions where they were able to see him or potentially see him. We want to be very powerful, very strong on background checks, and especially as it pertains to the mentally ill. Uh, we're going to get rid of the bump stocks, and we're going to do certain other things. But one of the feelings that I have, and you probably heard me in a speech this morning, uh, very, very important that we have offensive capability as well as defensive capability that's within the schools. because. Uh, when you have a gun-free zone, you're really inviting people to come in and do whatever you have to do and oftentimes get out. You know, I was the one that brought up the fact that these shootings on average last three minutes, and it takes anywhere from six to ten minutes for the police to get to the site. 
and I want to have people in the building. And in many cases, you have ex-Marines and ex-Army and Navy and Air Force and Coast Guard. You have them in the building, and they can have concealed weapons and still be teachers, or they could be in the building in a different capacity. But we have to have offensive capability to take these people out rapidly before they can do this kind of damage. But we'll be putting in uh, strong language having to do with the background checks, and that'll take place uh, very quickly. I spoke with Paul Ryan this morning, with Mitch McConnell, and people are looking to really energize. I, I know that you've had — this has been going on for a long time, many, many years. And you've had people in my position, and they would mention things, but not a lot of things got done, obviously. Uh, we take it very seriously. We want to put an end to it. And if, by the way, the bad guy thinks that somebody's in this room with a weapon that's going to be pointed at him with live bullets, he's not even going into the school. It's the one way you're going to solve it. You're not going to solve it with gun-free spaces, because they'll get in there, and they're going to be the only one with a gun. So we need offensive capability, and we're going to be doing something about it. Uh, we're dealing with Congress right now. Thank you. If I Thank follow you. follow up, Mr. President, amid talks of arming teachers and mental health, what specific commitments to American students can you make that these policies will make them safer? Well, I think it's going to make it safer. And, you know, the problem that's been happening over the last 20 years is people have talked. You said it. It's all talk. It's no action. And we're going to take action. I think it's going to make it safer. I think the fact that you have some capability within a school, they're not going to go into that school. They're not going to do it. You can look at what's happened with airplanes, where we put marshals on planes with guns, where pilots, in many cases, have guns. Nothing's happened for a long period of time, when it used to almost, it was getting to a point of being routine. When you have somebody with a gun staring you down, it's going to be a lot different for them to walk into those schools. Right now, they look at the sign outside. This is a gun-free environment. That means they're the only one with a gun. And the damage this lunatic did in that school for such a long period of time. And frankly, you had a gun, and he was outside as a guard, and he decided not to go in. That was not his finest moment, that I can tell you. He waited, and he didn't want to go into the school. I just heard this, and it's a terrible situation. But we need people that can take care of our children. We're not going to let this happen again. And the way it's not going to happen again, because they're basically cowards. Innately, they're cowards. And if they know bad things happen to them once they get into that school, by people that love the children. See, a security guard doesn't know the children, doesn't love the children. This man standing outside of the school the other day doesn't love the children, probably doesn't know the children. The teachers love their children. They love their pupils. They love their students. They're doing it also from love. Now, they have to be very adept. I'm not talking about every teacher. I'm talking about a small percentage. But people that have great ability with weaponry, with guns, those are the only people I'm talking about. But they'll protect the student. Uh, for the Prime Minister? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister for joining us today here in Washington. Australia is known for helping the Syrian people and Syrian refugees. So I ask you today, as the world watches, what steps can Australia take with the help of President Trump and the United States to ensure that civilians are protected in eastern Ghouta? Well, the, the Australian, uh, force, Australian armed forces have been working as part of the coalition to defeat Daesh in Iraq and Syria for some time now. Uh, it's uh, been, we are, our, our principal concentration or focus of our efforts now is in Iraq, uh, as opposed to Syria, uh, where we are training uh, both their elite special forces unit, their counterterrorism service, and their uh, regular army and uh, armed police. We have a very trained over 30,000 personnel uh, at our, um, at our uh, task force Taji which is based at the Taji airfield uh, near Baghdad. Uh, the, in terms of refugees, Australia uh, has a very substantial humanitarian program. We are currently taking about 18,000 refugees a year. Uh, we've taken, uh, we've taken 12,000 from the, in addition to that, from the Syrian conflict zone. But uh, we, we determine which, we are very careful about uh, security, of course, 
in terms of uh, our humanitarian program. But I think it would be fair to say that uh, the, the President uh, uh, has, of course, uh, the most insight into this area here, but it would be fair to say that ultimately the resolution in Syria has to be a political settlement, and that, I'm sure, is what uh, Secretary Tillerson is, uh, is working towards. And if I could briefly follow up specifically, though, in, in Syria, as two of the most powerful men in the entire world, is there anything <laughs> that you can do to stop the bloodshed? Well, the, ultimately, there has to be a political settlement. It is a, you, you know, the, the campaign to destroy Daesh or ISIL uh, has been largely completed. Their terror, you know, the so-called caliphate has been reduced down to, you know, a, a few pockets. Uh, it's been, it has been smashed. And that has been, and Americans and Australians have worked uh, bravely, uh, effectively, uh, with our allies and partners in the region to do that. And that's very important, by the way, to keep Australians and Americans safe at home, because the, the image of ISIL's invincible caliphate, you know, sweeping across Syria and Iraq, and they said they were going to sweep across Europe, all of that was a big recruiting tool. So this was a very important part of our global effort. But ultimately, uh, the settlement in, those, in that region has to come from a political settlement among the people who live there. I will say what Russia and what Iran and what Syria have done recently is a humanitarian disgrace. I will tell you that. We're there for one reason. We're there to get ISIS and get rid of ISIS and go home. We're not there for any other reason. And we've largely accomplished our goal. But what those three countries have done to people over the last short period of time is a disgrace. Okay. Would you like to ask a question, Mr. Prime Minister? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, yes, we Phil Curry from the Australian Financial Review. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Trump, Mr. Turnbull, uh, Phil Curry from the Financial Review. To, to you, Mr. Trump, just on the region and China and associated issues, the United States Navy has conducted frequently uh, freedom of, nav of, nav of navigation sail-throughs through the disputed areas. Um, would you like to see the Australian Navy participate directly um, in those operations alongside um, the US allies? And whilst on the region, can I ask you what your latest thinking is on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Are you softening your opposition to that, or do you remain, remain as opposed as ever? Well, I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership was not a good deal for us. And if they made it a good deal for us, I'd go in. But honestly, it wasn't. I like bilateral deals much more than multilateral. I like to be able to negotiate with one country. And if it doesn't work out, you terminate. And during the termination notice, right after you get sent, they call you and they say, please, let's make a deal, and you fix the deal. When you get into multi, you can't do that. But Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP was a very bad deal for the United States. It would have cost us tremendous amounts of jobs, would have been bad. But there's a possibility we would go in, but they will be offering us a much better deal. I would certainly do that. As far as your lanes are concerned, we'd love to have Australia involved. And I think Australia wants us to stay involved. I have to say, we've developed a great relationship with China, other than the fact that they've been killing us on trade for the last long period of time. Killing us, absolutely killing the United States on trade. But we have developed a great relationship with China, probably closer than we've ever had. And my personal relationship, as Malcolm can tell you, with uh, President Xi is, uh, I think, quite extraordinary. He's uh, somebody that I like, and I think he likes me. With that being said, he likes China, and I like the United States. But uh, a lot of things are happening. It's going to be a very interesting period of time. But we do have to straighten out. And as much as I like and respect, really respect President Xi, we have to straighten out the trade imbalance. It's too much. It's no good. OK. Uh, Kieran Gilbert from Sky News. Kieran Gilbert, Sky News Australia. General Mattis has called China a revisionist power and that there are growing threats from China, yet you're very positive about your relationship with Xi. I'm, can you tell us, is it, is it a friend or a foe? And on North Korea, uh, the sanctions, if they don't work, are all options still on the table? Can I get 
your answer and also the Prime Minister's thoughts? Well, to the second, we'll have to see. Uh, I don't think I'm going to exactly play that card. But we'll have to see. If the sanctions don't work, we'll have to go phase two. And phase two may be a very rough thing, it may be very, very unfortunate for the world. But hopefully the sanctions will work. We have tremendous support all around the world for what we're doing. It really is a rogue nation. If we can make a deal, it'll be a great thing. And if we can't, something will have to happen. So we'll see. As far as uh, General Mattis is concerned, I mean, he has that view, and a lot of people have that view. Uh, China's tough. They're getting stronger. They're getting stronger to a large extent with a lot of the money they've made from having poor leadership in the United States, because United States leadership has allowed them to get away with murder. With that being said, I think we can have a truly great even trading relationship with China. Hopefully, that's going to work out. And hopefully, the relationship I have with President Xi will make that happen. Only time will tell. Thank you. Well, I can confirm that uh, uh, President Trump and President Xi uh, see eye to eye in, um, in, uh, in every respect. Uh, and they, they have a it is, it's very clear at the meetings I've been at, uh, which, which we've attended in the region, the East Asia Summit and uh, so forth, a APEC, the respect that they have with each other, and I think it's the most single most important relationship uh, between China and the United States. It's clearly uh, very respectful, very frank, very clear-eyed. Uh, for, for our own part, uh, we see China's rise as being uh, overwhelmingly a positive for the region and for the world. The critical thing, of course, is the rule of law is maintained. You know, that is, you know, the, 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 there are people that want to try to paint uh, the United States and its, and its allies like Australia as being against China in some sort of rerun of the Cold War. Uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is not appropriate, it's not accurate. What we need to ensure is that the rules of the road, the rule of law, the rules-based system, where you know big countries can't push around little countries, where, to quote Lee Kuan Yew all those years ago, where you don't have a world where the big fish eat the little fish and the little fish eat the shrimps, where you have that rule of law that protects everybody, that is what has enabled the great growth in our region. That's what's enabled hundreds of millions of people in our region and including in China to be lifted out of poverty. So maintaining that rules-based order is what we are committed to and we all have a vested interest in doing so. And I just want to say again to the President that, the, that his, his presence, his own personal presence in our region at the end of last year was sent such a powerful message the regular visits by Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, and of course, the presence of the United States Navy and so many other manifestations of American commitment to the region is so important to maintaining that rules-based order. Believe me, that has been the foundation of the success, the prosperity, and the security these last 40 or more years. I don't think we've ever had a better relationship with China than we do right now. The only thing that can get in its way is trade, because it's so one-sided, it's so lopsided, and the people that stood here for many years in this position, right where I am right now, should never have allowed that to happen. It's very unfair to the United States, and it's very unfair to the workers of the United States. Very, very unfair. And even today, it's extremely hard on companies that want to do business in China because the barriers are incredible, whereas the barriers coming into our country are foolishly not. Foolishly. I believe in reciprocal trade. If they do something to us, we do something to them. Well, that never happened. And it's gotten worse and worse over the years, but we'll correct it. That can be the only thing that can get in the way of a truly long-term great relationship, because we have all the ingredients for friendship. From the Washington Examiner, Gabby. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your Chief of Staff, General Kelly, has recommended ending the practice of granting interim security clearances to members of the Trump administration. Yeah. If that proceeds, would you be willing to grant a waiver to Jared Kushner, one of your senior advisors? Well, Jared's done an outstanding job. I think he's been treated very unfairly. He's a high-quality person. Uh, he works for nothing, just so, you know, nobody ever reports that. But he gets zero. He doesn't get a salary, nor does Ivanka, who's now in South Korea, long trip, representing her country. And we cannot get a better representative. In fact, the First Lady, Melania, was telling me what a great impression she made this morning when she landed in South Korea. Jared is um, truly outstanding. He's, he's, he was very successful when he was in the private sector. He's working on peace in the Middle East and some other small and very easy deals. They've always said peace in the Middle East, peace between the Palestinians and Israel is the toughest deal of any deal there is. Now, come, I've heard this all my life, that as a former dealmaker, although now you could say maybe I'm more of a dealmaker than ever before, you have no choice as president to do it right. But the hardest deal to make of any kind is between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We're actually making great headway. Jerusalem was the right thing to do. We took that off the table. But Jared Kushner is right in the middle of that, and he's an extraordinary dealmaker. And if he does that, that will be an incredible accomplishment and a very important thing for our country. So General Kelly, who's doing a terrific job, by the way, is uh, right in the middle of that. We inherited a system that's broken. It's a system where many people have just — it's taken months and months and months to get many people that do not have a complex financial — you know, complicated financials. They don't have that, and it's still taken months. It's a broken system, and it shouldn't take this long. You know how, how many people are on that list? People with not a problem in the world. So that'll be up to General Kelly. Uh, General Kelly respects Jared a lot, and General Kelly will make that call. I won't make that call. I will let the general, who's right here, make that call. But Jared's uh, doing some very important things for our country. He gets paid zero. Ivanka, by the way, gets paid zero. She gave up a very good and very strong, solid, big business in order to come to Washington because she wanted to help families and she wanted to help women. She said, Dad, I want to go to Washington. I want to help women. And I said, you know, it's, Washington's a mean place. She said, I don't care. I want to help women. I want to help families. And she was very much involved, as you know, in the child tax credit. And now she's working very much on family leave, things that I don't think would have been in the agreement if it weren't for Ivanka and some of our great senators, et cetera. But she was very much in the forefront of that. So uh, I will let General Kelly make that decision. And he's going to do what's right for the country. And I have no doubt he'll make the right decision. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. For the uh, yeah. uh, your country conducted a buyback program of semi-automatic weapons back in the mid-90s and hasn't had a mass shooting ever since. Is this something that you've discussed with President Trump, and did you at all re urge him to reconsider his current recommendations to combat mass shootings in the United States? Well, the — our — history with uh, gun control and regulation is obviously very different to the United States. And, and you're right, uh, there was a mass shooting in Tasmania in 1996. And my predecessor, John Howard, who's very well known uh, here in the United States, Prime Minister for nearly 12 years, uh, John uh, undertook some very big reforms and basically uh, semi-automatic and let alone automatic weapons are essentially not available. Uh, indeed, uh, there are many classes of the, the range of firearms that are available to uh, uh, people that don't have a specific, you know, professional need, like you know, people who are involved in pest control and so forth, uh, are very, very limited. But it's it's a completely different uh, context historically, legally, and so forth. Uh, we are very satisfied with our laws. We maintain them. Uh, we, they're there, they're well known, you've referred to them, but we certainly don't presume to uh, provide, uh, you know, a policy or political advice on, on that matter 
here. This is a, a, you have a, an amendment to your constitution uh, which deals with uh, gun ownership. You have a very, very different history and I uh, will um, focus on our own political arguments and debates and uh, uh, wish you wise deliberation in your own. And I have to add to that, they're very different countries with very different sets of problems. But I think we're well on the way to solving that horrible problem that happens far too often in the United States. Thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.